Thank you, Henry, for that uh, introduction. Yeah, if we could just make it so easy to get funding to go to Paris and just ask for funding, then they would... Uh... Bon, so today, uh, toward cognitive systems for cooperation via cognitive neuroscience, neural networks, and robotics. So this will all become clear to you what this means uh, over the presentation. Um, I just wanted to, to situate, as Henry started to say, where we are. So we're a team in the Department of Integrative Neurosciences, uh, Cortical Networks for Cognitive Interaction, and we also have the Robot Cognition Laboratory. And these are all of the nice people that make up the team. So we're actually three uh, statutaire chercheurs, uh, two postdocs, an engineer, uh, and, and several PhD students, some of whom have just become doctors, some who will be soon becoming doctors. So things are evolving in a, in a nice way. And it's really the work of these people that, um, that I'm going to be presenting. So I'm just going to give you some general ideas that, that hopefully will make sense. Uh, the, at first, we'll talk about what is the embodied cognitive system for a robot. And then, and then go to some more down-to-earth things related to cognitive neuroscience, and in particular, the corticostriatal system. You will see at the end of this talk that I love the corticostriatal system. It's one of the major uh, uh, organi organizing principles of the primate brain. And then things will become progressively metaphysical. So first, we'll talk about uh, and implement based on cooperation with our, our colleagues at the Max Planck Institute in... Um, in Leipzig, Mike Tomasello and Felix Warnikin, cooperation. Then we'll get into something a little bit more metaphysical of meaning. What is meaning? How do we represent meaning? How can a robot represent meaning? And finally, it will turn out that if you really want to have a social robot, being social means putting yourself in the position of the other in a certain sense. And so to be in the position of the other, you have to, in a certain sense, have or possess a self. To, to, to relate to the other, you have to be a self. And so we're, we're going to start getting into some issues about robots possessing a self. And the, as Henry alluded to, kind of the methodology that we use it has been summarized by, by Richard Feynman, who is a, a physicist at Caltech who won the Nobel Prize and did a number of very interesting things. And he was kind of an unusual character, and he said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So he liked to build things. He liked to see examples of things that function in order to understand. And so this is kind of, in a humble, modest way, we try to take this approach in the team. So that is, we're going to try to get insight from our studies in cognitive neuroscience and build neural network models and implant these neural network models in robots that can interact with people in order to try to understand by building systems. And so ideally, there's feedback between these different uh, research areas that, that nourish each other. So it's kind of a, 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 a win all, you know, multiple winners in the, in the system. So I'm showing you here a, a figure that actually was created in 2007. Uh, the Italian Institute of Technology, who built the iCub robot, made a call for proposals to distribute six copies of this robot to laboratories in Europe. And so we submitted a proposal in 2008 to have one of these robots. And part of the proposal was to develop this kind of a cognitive system. And so the idea was that there would be uh, an embodied and continuous component. So embodied and continuous. Here, if you see my joints moving, these joint angles are continuous values. Uh, vision is a continuous thing. Spatial perception, action execution. So there's this notion of, of continuous. But then on the other hand, there's a notion of, in contrast to embodied and continuous, a notion of propositional. So yes, no. Uh, object names, is the object on the table. So this kind of logical or propositional way of talking about things that includes using language to interact. And then, and then there should have to be some kind of transformation between this predicate argument propositional kind of representation and this continuous embodied representation. So we would work on this. And then finally, the notion was that 
this system would have to have some kind of representation of meaning and that this representation of meaning would be like having a mental simulation so that the robot would actually, as it's claimed that we do, simulate actions in its mind and that understanding would be a form of simulation. And so our project said that we would build this system. And so I was looking, I dug out this project recently and said, okay, so it's now four years later, how did we do? And so in fact, um, they gave us the robot and I think that we can say that we've made significant progress in building the system, and that's what I'm going to try to, um, to show you today. So we're going to start with some grounding in cognitive neuroscience. And again, I was kind of joking, but I do love the cortical striatal system because it is so prominently a structural feature of the primate brain. So when you see the cortex, and in fact, in this room right now, this is the cortex project, right? So people are kind of corticocentric, but you cannot, don't forget the subcortical structures. And in fact, the cortex would be nothing without the, without the striatum, without the input nucleus of the basal ganglia. If you had no striatum, your cortex would be totally useless. The, the projections from the cortex to the striatum are massive, massive, massive. So one of the really, if you don't know any neuroanatomy, you can learn one thing today, and that is that one of the major organizing principles of the primate brain is indeed the cortex and the basal ganglia, but the projection from the cortex to the striatum. And, and this projection is modifiable. That is, the synapses are modifiable by dopamine. And so this is a massive system for learning to occur between what's being represented in the cortex and the striatum. And I was looking, just in preparing the talk, back into the historical record and uh, we've been working on the cortical striatal system with um, Emmanuel Broussel and, uh, and Stefan Taubois here at the Neurology Hospital since 1995. So this, this, um, we've, we've studied this system extensively in the human. And one of the interesting things, um, if you look at this, you can imagine what would be the structure of the connectivity here? Would it be mixed or would it have some kind of organization? Would the, would the topographic organization of cortex be preserved in the projection to the striatum? And in fact, uh, through some recent human uh, studies with Parkinson patients um, in the team, Jocelyn uh, published a paper recently showing that using human uh, subthalamic nucleus stimulation patients, you can actually uh, give evidence to the preservation of topography between the cortex and the striatum in kind of an indirect way with the, with the story that goes like this. The stimulating electrodes are placed in the subthalamic nucleus at a particular location to prevent uh, or, or to reduce the motor signs, including rigidity and, and trembling. So the stimulation will have a, a specific effect in the cortex uh, in, the, in the subthalamic nucleus and through topographic projections that go through this cortico, basal ganglia, thalamus uh, system that includes the subthalamic nucleus, the effects of this topography of stimulation are observed then in the cortex. So, so the, I won't go into details, but the take home message is that there's a dissociation between dorsal and ventral frontal cortical areas that are influenced by this precise topographically located uh, stimulating electrode in the subthalamic nucleus. So there's an effect on one, but not the other. So giving evidence of this topography in the cortical striatal system. So what we've tried to do in the team in terms of um, exploiting this kind of information in the, um, now in making, in, in making this transfer from neuroscience to neural networks and robotics, can be illustrated in the following figure. So here we see again this famous figure that's illustrating in a certain way that you've got cortex and the striatum in this massive projection between them. So what we can do is try to make a theoretical model of this. And so what we can say is the cortex is characterized by um, principally local dense recurrent connections. And and so we can model this, uh, this cortical structure as a 
what we call a reservoir of neurons that are interconnected uh, recurrently. And then we can model the striatum, which receives projections from the cortex, simply as a structure that receives projections from this reservoir that's modeling the cortex. And so we had done uh, modeling of this kind of system for some time, and then it was recently noted that, um, uh, that, this, that this model uh, falls into the category of systems called reservoir computing. And so reservoir computing is kind of a larger framework for this kind of, of neural network where neurons that are connected by non-modifiable connections get input from the exterior. They do work on that input and then a readout layer extracts meaning or, or some kind of structure from that, um, from, from that representation. And so we were recently involved in a, um, in a, a European project with Wolfgang Moss and Herbert Jaeger and Ben Schrauen, who are kind of uh, pioneers in this area. And that work uh, allowed the financing of the uh, PhD thesis of uh, Pierre Enel and Xavier Eno. So Xavier Eno, who just defended his thesis uh, last week, I'm going to show you some of the work that he did trying to demonstrate that we start from the human cortex and basal ganglia. We make this model. Then we try to simulate what's happening in the cortex and basal ganglia, and then eventually go back and test these simulations in, uh, in human studies. So here we show this kind of uh, scary figure that is um, showing how the corticostriatal system can be used for sentence processing. And so the idea is that we get, uh, we're going to get sentences as input, and the output is this kind of strange representation of meaning that I'll take a minute to, to explain to you uh, how to read this, because it's actually quite interesting. So meaning, we're going to say, is represented in a format of predicate, agent, object, recipient. So for example, the sentence, John was hit by Mary, would have a meaning representation in this predicate, agent, object, recipient format, where predicate is hit, agent is Mary, object is John, and there's no recipient. So the idea is that the model should get input like this and produce output like that. And so the way that we can do that is to, is to construct an architecture that I'll now explain to you. So the input sentences uh, first go through a process where the, the, what we call the semantic words are pulled out and stored to later be reconstructed into the meaning. And the, the heart of the sentence, that is this grammatical structure that's indicated by slots where the, op where the semantic words were and these special grammatical or closed class words, those words each have a dedicated neuron that gives a pulse of input into the reservoir when that word arrives in the sentence. So this, this reservoir is getting a, a set of, of pulses that correspond to semantic word, was, semantic word, by, semantic word. That's going to produce an activation pattern in this network. And then the model should learn by training, by a, a learning mechanism that I'll describe, should learn to associate that pattern of activity with activation of the output neurons that are coded this way. So we've got a set of output neurons that correspond to the first semantic word, the second semantic word, and the third semantic word. So what we're showing here is what the output of the reservoir should be for this kind of sentence. So it should say, it should activate more strongly the neuron that says the first semantic word is the object, the second semantic word is the predicate, and the third semantic word is the agent. And then finally, with this kind of activation, then we can bring these semantic words back. So just preserving their order first, second, and third goes into the first, second, and third that says the first semantic word was the object, the second semantic word was the predicate, and the third semantic word was the agent. And so after training the, the reservoir to make these kind of connections, we can then test its ability to operate on new sentences and to generalize on new grammatical constructions. And so to, to understand in full detail the greatness of the model, I'm going to have to give you a quick grammar lesson about subject relative and object relative sentences. So if you see the sentence, the dog that chased the cat bit the boy, this is called a subject-subject or subject-relative sentence. And what that means is that the first 
noun is the subject of the first verb and the subject of the second verb. So it's the subject of both verbs. And these sentences are more frequent in English and they're easier to process. And then this is a subject object relative, the dog that the cat chased bit the boy. And so here there's kind of a switching of perspective because the dog is the object of this phrase and then the um, subject of the main phrase. And so this perspective changing seems to take mental effort. It's syntactically considered more complex. And also these sentences are less frequent in, the, in English. And so what has been observed uh, extensively is that when you get to these words that resolve uh, what kind of relative phrase you're going to have, you get a P600 evoked potential on the scalp that is stronger for the object relative sentences. So you can see from the, the PZ, CZ, and FZ electrodes here that there's a, a greater positivity for these object relative words than the subject relative. And so there's been a lot of uh, discussion about why, you know, what is the, the source of generating this, um, this phenomena. And it turns out that the model of Xavier can say something about that. So what we're going to look at here is the the output of these neurons in real time as each word of the sentence is being processed. And so what we see is, uh, so this is the sentence, the, the noun, that verb, the noun, verb, the noun. So the, the cat that bit the boy chased the dog. So this is the subject, subject relative. And so what we can see when you read this, let's just look at this blue trace, which corresponds for the verb, the, the neuron that says that noun one is the agent. So it becomes ac active right at the outset of the sentence, uh, and it's essentially predicting the probability of noun one being the agent uh, over the corpus that it has been trained on. So in general, noun one is the, is the agent. That's what it thinks at the outset, and that seems to be confirmed, and that stays true throughout the sentence. Now if we look at the subject-object relative, where the end that the the, uh, so now this is this relative clause where uh, noun one is in fact the object of the, of the first verb. So the model starts off doing exactly the same thing. Okay, I think that the first noun is the agent, but then all of a sudden when it sees the, the word the, that indicates that word the is the marker that says, oh, we are in a subject object relative sentence. And so that tells the model to switch. It switches, changes its mind from here, and says, no, 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 this first, uh, this first noun is the, is the object. And so if you look at these, if you look at the model, it's what, at what's happening at this point in time, we have the intuition, or it can be seen that it looks like, whereas here, activity is kind of proceeding as before, here, there's this sort of dramatic shift. There's a lot of lines going up and down. And if we just, uh, so with Xavier, we just calculated the, the sum of the differences, or the, the kind of the, the derivative or the, the change in all the neurons in the output at that time. And if you plot that here, if you compare this, this change in activity for the response to this verb, which says it's a regular subject subject sentence versus the word the, which says it's a subject object sentence, we see a huge difference in activity here versus here. And so in fact, this is the first time that a neural network model of sentence processing could predict or produce something like a P600, describing it as a change in what was being predicted uh, uh, based on the, the training corpus. And so this is actually interesting, and, and Xavier has an appointment with Peter Haggart, who is one of the fathers of the P600, to, to perhaps find a postdoc to, um, to try to look into this in more detail. So what we try to do then in, the, in this philosophy of building this cognitive system for the robot is, uh, is with Xavier and Maxime Petit to insert this, uh, this neural network model into the human-robot interaction system. And so here we have a, a nice video. So basically what you're going to see, this is after training, and now Xavier is going to pronounce a sentence to the, uh, to the robot, and it will understand it and then perform the action. Thank uh -huh. 
Okay, so now we're gonna we're starting to fill in some boxes in this uh, in this architecture. So now we've got we've built up this kind of spoken language processing, and with Xavier's model, a system that can do the transformation between these predicate argument representations of, of speech and the and the the continuous domain of action. So. To make a long story short, the, the cooperation, doing things together with people, it requires many things, including a shared plan. And so what's represented here is a diagram made by Mike Tomasello and his colleagues showing the representation inside the brain of two people trying to work together to open a box. And the, the bottom line is that it seems kind of trivial, but it's worth knowing it, that when you're doing something with someone, you have a representation of what you're doing and what they're doing and what you're doing together and some kind of articulated plan of who does what in what kind of order. And so you can see uh, this is an example showing the behavior of a boy who's seen one demonstration of this funny game where one person puts a, a can down at the bottom of a tube and the other one launches a block to, um, to be caught. So this kid, he's about uh, 18 months old. He's seen one demonstration of this, and he knows what to do. So this is evidence that he's not just blindly doing something. He's coordinated with, with uh, Felix. So now Felix has gone off to the side. He's interrupted his play. And you can see this kid is motivated. He wants the game to continue. And so uh, he's actually going to go and get Felix and, and bring him over to, to play the game. So. It's beautiful research how they show that, that human beings are intrinsically motivated to share mental states and to cooperate. And so as part of the thesis work here is shown, uh, Stefan Lally, um, with, the, with some nice publications over the three years of his thesis, we worked with Tomasello and his colleagues to define what is a shared plan and how to implement that in the robot. And, <clears throat> And basically, the idea is that you have this notion of me, you, and we. And so the we, the we intention is what we're going to do together. And then I know what I'm going to do, and you know what you're going to do. And we can even negotiate on who does what. But the notion is that you've got this plan that includes actions that you're not going to do, but that, that are part of the plan. And so we recently uh, uh, exploited this. So what I'm going to show you here is, uh, is in a, during the course of about two minutes, Gregoire Puento is going to give this complex uh, plan to the now robot to tell him that you're going to help me clean up this table. We're going to throw this object into a trash can and who does what. The, what you'll see is that the now will understand what's being said. He will misunderstand one thing that Gregoire can correct using spoken language. And then the now will recognize that he does not know how to open the trash box and he does not know how to close the trash box. And Gregoire is going to show him how to do these things in real time. And then finally, they will realize, the, uh, realize this task together. No, I do not. 
il s'énerve. So now he's going to go into a learning phase. So now at this point, uh, to, to teach the robot how to close the, um, how to close the box, he's going to go into a kinesthetic demonstration mode where the stiffness of the arm will be turned off and the person can move the, uh, move the arm. So we saw this kind of visual imitation. Now we'll see kinesthetic demonstration. So now the behavior that was that was learned is used. So this actually we did in, the, in Istanbul uh, in 2011 in front of a thousand people with the judge saying, okay, now it's your turn to go. You have five minutes to make it work. We had to turn on the Wi-Fi router, da, 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 get everything set up. You have one chance to make it go. And we were going crazy and, uh, and it worked. But uh, so, so, that's, um, so that's a demonstration where you can now learn these kind of shared plans. Uh, through multiple, uh, multiple modalities. So now, we've, now we're making progress. We've got uh, the spoken language, the, this, this language relation with the continuous domain, the shared plans. But what we're missing is any kind of notion of meaning. So wh where is meaning? Uh, and in fact, this, this system, it, it, there, there's no representation, a real representation of meaning. And so several years ago, Carol Madden joined our group um, to help fill in this gap because uh, she brings in the, the component that talks about meaning as being grounded or embodied in the sensory motor system. And so as part of the thesis of Anne-Lise Juan, uh, Anne-Lise did an experiment where she presented subjects with pictures of kind of rich uh, social activity, people doing the, uh, jumping into the swimming pool, and then sentences describing these same kind of activities. And what we expected to find modestly was activation in the, in the, in the premotor parietal mirror system. And that would be activated though, the novelty would be that it would be activated both by sentences and pictures. And to our 
nice surprise, what we found is not only activation in this system, but also in the retrosplenial complex for spatial representation, the default uh, mode network for theory of mind kind of activation. In fact, we found activation of, of, of systems for reasoning, et cetera, which give the impression that Understanding means activating the entire cognitive system and plunging yourself into the scene that you're understanding. So understanding is really using your entire brain almost to, to, to put yourself into the situation that you're understanding. And at the same time, we did a DTI scan on these same subjects. And we show here uh, uh, white matter pathways going from the temporal parietal junction uh, here in the kind of a, what we call a trifurcating pathway using known fasciculi going to the frontal pole, the temporal pole, and the premotor cortex. So there's this kind of branching uh, neuroanatomical system uh, for representing meaning that we can see both in the, in the white matter pathways and in the, uh, the brain activation. And I just want to mention, I won't go into the analysis, but this is data from a patient that, uh, that Ann Lees and Sullivan Ido uh, recorded with Jean, uh, Jean, Jean Philippe Lachaud, excuse me, brain uh, damage, uh, Lachaud uh, with one of his patients in Grenoble, uh, looking at picture processing, sentence processing, uh, coherent and incoherent uh, images. And so I'm not going to say what we're seeing here, but the data is being analyzed. So this is a good opportunity that we've taken advantage of within the Cortex project to, um, to collaborate with, uh, with Lachaud. So now we've got this notion of uh, um, what it should be like, the meaning system. The meaning sh system should be embodied. It should, it should use uh, multiple brain systems. But how can we implement that? And so we've been kind of, um, we're going to get metaphysical now. We've got about 10 minutes of, of metaphysics. Um, so we're inspired by the French philosopher Merleau-Ponty and the importance of the body schema. And so Merleau-Ponty said that the body schema is not a representation, but an experience. It is the knowledge that the body has of itself. And so in the robot, we're trying to figure out how can we give this to the robot. And so Stefan Lally, uh, during the end of his thesis, started using self-organizing maps in order to allow the robot to have a representation of its own action. And so what, I'm, what I show here is that these self-organizing maps can be used to make kind of a, a, a multimodal representation of the arm position, the head position, vision, and speech while the robot is doing something. So the robot was doing kind of a rock, scissors, paper game, and at the same time learning all the correlations of what was its body doing during this kind of interaction. And that gives a multimodal representation that has a topography like can be seen in motor cortex, but that can be used, for example, to evoke mental images. So if you stimulate a part of this map that is being activated when the robot is actually performing the scissors configuration, but it's physically doing nothing, then you will produce a visual imagery uh, that corresponds to that action. So at this point, we're now getting closer to some kind of a representation of the, um, of the, the self in terms of the, in terms of the body schema. And at the same time, uh, we're also introducing a, um, an autobiographical memory where the robot can now keep track of episodes like this over the past and begin to, to construct a representation of itself in time. Uh, we can talk about that if you have questions. That's work of the thesis of Gregoire Puento on the IFA project. Um, yeah, and so the final thing is, uh, and this is the most metaphysical, I hope you can somehow appreciate it. I was quite um, astounded when I read this. Uh, so this is Maurice Merleau-Ponty, translated by Philippe Rochat in a paper in Neuropsychology in 2010 from his, uh, yeah, the Le Les Cours de Sorbonne. So he's talking about the relationship between self and other. And he says, in the perception of others, my body and the body of others are coupled as if performing and acting in concert. This behavior that I can only see in others, I somehow embody it at a distance. I make this behavior becoming mine. I take it over and understand it. 
It is the transfer of my intention into the body of others and of others' intentions into my own body. This alienation of others by me and by me of others that renders possible the perception of others. So this uh, still gives me un petit peu de chair de poule when I read this because uh, it's, um, yeah, chicken skin. It's <laughs> it goosebumps is how you say that in, in English. The, um, how could this work? How could this representation of, of other be incorporated into the self? So if we uh, think about it, one way that this can be done, in fact, is, and that we're working on now, is, is to use these, these multimodal convergence maps and just to make one simple astuce, and that is to say that the, the, the maps can have representations that come from the robot, so the robot can represent its own body schema, but it can also perceive, while it's interacting with the human, through the connect and through its eyes, it can perceive the behavior of the human. And so the behavior of the human can be incorporated into this multimodal representation as if it was self-behavior. It's just another dimension. So it's another dimension that's being uh, processed and put into this multimodal representation. And so what we're working on at the moment is using this kind of thing as a scheme where the system could learn something about the pointing gesture, for example, so that if it learns that when it's doing like this, the gaze of the human go converges to the same point, then it can learn this this convergence. It's similar to the work of Ricky with, um, with uh, incorporating tools into the body schema, except here you're actually incorporating another individual into the body schema. So this is, uh, we, we think this is very exciting, but it is getting a little bit metaphysical. So, um, yeah, so I just go back to the general ideas. I hope I've kind of convinced you that we've now begun to fill out this, uh, this diagram of the ICUB embodied cognitive system schema. And yeah, maybe I didn't make the argument well enough, but I believe that the corticostriatal system is a powerful general learning system. Uh, and then these are kind of some more metaphysical things. Cooperation requires shared plans. Meaning is embodied. And social interaction requires the representation of self and other. And the, our job in this, um, in this démarche of trying to build cognitive systems is to, is to try to use this information in a productive way to build systems that can be tested. And I think that is the fin. I thought you were going to talk about mirror neurons for a while. This representation of the mm. other and the self and, and this embodiment. Yep. It sounded well, then, like you were warming up to that, but you didn't. Yeah, then I, then I kind of cooled off. No, en fait, Merleau-Ponty, they said uh, that he, pre he was the predecessor of mirror neurons. His, uh, his system, he was predicting the existence of mirror neurons. And in a certain sense, um, in this kind of system, you could see activity that would be like mirror neurons. When the, if, if, um, if the system was trained in a certain way where it co-experienced uh, the human and it doing the same kind of thing at the same time, like if they'd been imitating each other, then seeing just the human perform that activity would produce this mirror activity and would even tend to, to entice the robot to perform the same action. Questions from the floor? Yes. <clears throat> On the same point, actually, I'm not, it's not clear to me how you would map exactly the representation of the body of other into your own representation of the body. I mean, to map exactly the... Yeah, well, that's, so it wouldn't, uh, and that's where it would possibly diverge from being a perfect mirror system. The, the idea, imagine that, uh, that we do a training session where uh, the robot is just pointing around in space, and the human is being a nice human and either, say, pointing to the same location or looking, orienting his gaze to that same location. And so what, we'll, what that will produce is that the, at the same time that the arm and head of the iCub are oriented in a certain way, the arm and the head of the human will be oriented in a certain way, and the system will learn those co-occurrences. So it's kind of learning a mapping of what is the response of the human to my, uh, when I am in this configuration. But the, the thing that's kind of tricky is that it's, it's all mapped 
in a, in a system that's not differentiating where that information came from, whether it came from sensors telling me where my body is, or whether it came from my other sensors like vision telling me where your gaze is. Does that correspond to what we know about human development and the way humans actually develop the sense of the Yeah, I, I think so. It's, I mean, it's worth testing. So we have a, um, th there's a woman named Danielle Matthews who studies the development of um, declarative pointing in the, in the human. And, and so the idea is to try to see if in this, uh, in this kind of framework, if the, if, the, if the human who's interacting with the robot behaves in a particular way, will that allow this notion of, um, of, of declarative pointing to be learned or to emerge in the robot? So, yeah, so the answer to the question is, at this moment in time, this kind of framework is a potential tool to study current theories of, of the development in, in children. Uh, so you, you mentioned uh, your interest about the basal ganglia, and, and you introduced the uh, general architecture of the reservoir uh, yeah. neural network. So I'm just wondering if you tried to add some uh, models that are more uh, biologically plausible, at, uh, at least at the uh, uh, connectivity level. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's kind of a classic question, and, and it's a good question to ask. The, the point is, when you make a model, what are you trying to model? And, and so if you say, what I'm trying to model is, or I'm trying to make a model that tests the hypothesis that a, a cortical system with recurrent connections can encode spatial temporal regularities of inputs, and that uh, a stridal system can read those uh, through learning, can decode the meaning or the, the, the structure of those representations in cortex. If that's the level of the question that you're asking, then the reservoir is the appropriate level to, to model at. If you're, if you're trying to go, so, so realistic uh, needs to be defined. If you say, well, that's not realistic for me because your neurons don't spike, for example, then you could say, well, we can, then we can do this with spiking neurons, which is what Wolfgang Mass does. For this kind of question, that essentially just introduces more complexity into the, into the system. But so the short answer is, depending on the level of the question you're asking, this is a biologically plausible uh, model. But if you want to go deeper into certain aspects, uh, then it is unplausible. And then at some point you have to say, is that implausibility, does that negate its usefulness for the kind of question I'm trying to ask? Yeah, so the, the general idea is, is, is really, and even why they call it a reservoir, imagine this like a big pool of water. You drop a stone into it, and that's going to make kind of a pattern of activity. And now if you drop another stone into it, that pat, the new pattern of activity will be a function of where you threw that current stone plus where you threw the first one and how long ago. Because you, you're, you're essentially, or, or in other words, this is a dynamical system that's sensitive to perturbations, and it has a history capability because of the recurrent connections. So it's sensitive to events in the past, and those events create a state that will make it act differently in response to events now. And then, so it's a state machine that encodes the past. And then through these modifiable connections, you can associate those states with any arbitrary output that you like. So you can use it for discriminating sequences, reproducing sequences, discriminating uh, posotic attitude. Any kind of continuous temporal input that you can use as an input can be represented. And then you can define any arbitrary response that you want to that input. So that's, I don't know, does that give you a... It, it must be said also that this is an extremely, yeah, I didn't, I didn't go into that, but it, in terms of machine learning, this is a hugely powerful machine that a lot of learning techniques have been developed for. And so part of the, the strength of Xavier's thesis was to make this link between this area of machine learning and, uh, and cognitive neuroscience. Last question from Ken. Um, I have this question. Not sure if you express it into a question. There's this. Um, Test for self the, the development that people think is very critical. Yeah. Where they, they, they put a little dot on the head and they yeah. put the in front of the mirror and see whether it touches the dot. Is, is there something like that you can envision? 
for a test of self? Can you it or? Sure. I mean, yeah. So you could. I mean, you, what we could do is with this. Um, yeah, and Stefan, uh, he thought of all this interesting stuff right before he left on his thesis, on, after his thesis. But um, you, yeah, you could certainly imagine you take this robot and you put it in front of a mirror. And so now it's, 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 it's learning uh, this, this mapping of its proprioceptive sense with an image that it has of itself. And then, yeah, it would take, um, in order to then recognize that this dot is on my head, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the framework is in place. It's probably not perfectly ready to, to, to provide insight. But the, in fact, even saying what is the delta between what we have now and what is necessary to provide insight into this question, even having that framework itself is already very interesting because it makes you, it forces you to, to, to be explicit about how do you think it works in the infant. Great. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you.